Pull up any spot in the solver and you'll see that the majority of hands are mixing between bet and check. But what should we actually do with them in practice? Can we just pick any option we want? Or do we need to mix it up at the right frequency? There are plenty of high stakes players who use an RNG for this very reason. But if you're playing lower stakes, randomizing could be hurting your win rate instead. But before we get to that, we first need to understand what randomizing actually accomplishes. Imagine if a certain hand, let's say top pair, is supposed to bet exactly 60% of the time. Our brains aren't really designed to do this, but with the help of a random number generator, we can bet if we roll less than 60 and check if we roll more than 60. Ultimately, the goal is to have just the right amount of top pair in our betting and checking range. If we bet more than 60%, our checking range will not have enough top pair, thereby making us exploitable. If we bet less than 60%, our checking range will have too much top pair, which also makes us exploitable, albeit in a different way. So by hitting the right frequency, we ensure that our checking range has the perfect proportion of top pair, such that our opponent cannot exploit us even if we told them our strategy. Well, that is provided we also get the frequencies of all the other hand classes correct. Let's do a simple experiment where we keep the frequency of top pair at 60%, but we bet slightly less error than we're supposed to. You can see that the proportion of top pair in our checking range actually decreases despite us betting it at the exact same frequency. This is because the extra error that we check has the effect of diluting our top pair combos. So the only way to achieve 10% of top pair in our checking range is to bet not just top pair at the right frequency, but every other hand class as well. It's a bit like building a house of cards where every card represents a certain hand class. You can stack the cards as perfectly as you want, but get the frequency of one hand class wrong and the entire house falls apart. This is the main difficulty with trying to emulate GTO. The strategy is so complex that it's simply not possible for a human to execute. The best we can do is approximate it, and even that requires a ton of study and practice. But let's assume that we put in a ton of work and were able to get closer to GTO than any other human player. Would that automatically make us a crusher? Well, not necessarily. The thing is, poker isn't about who can play closer to GTO. In fact, it's possible to play really close to GTO and still lose out to someone who is deviating massively. Imagine a river scenario where we are very slightly overfolding. Perhaps the GTO strategy is to call 50% of our range, but we are calling 49.9% instead. About as close as we can hope to be. Now imagine we are up against a maniac who is bluffing 100% of his air. We would actually be losing EV in this case, despite the fact that we are playing closer to GTO. This is because the overfold gives the Maniac's bluffs a small amount of EV, and they are maximizing this EV by bluffing 100% of their error. There is a very nice analogy by Uri Pelek that illustrates this problem. I'll let him put it in his own words. Imagine that uh, you have one guy uh, who's spent his entire life crafting an indestructible suit of armor. This is the guy who's studying with a solver, he's making his game indestructible. And all of his focus is on his armor, he's always looking inwards because if the armor is indestructible, he doesn't care who's coming up against him. But, unfortunately, 10 to 20% of his armor is riddled with holes. Now this guy, send him to battle, he's obviously not gonna do too well. His eyes are closed, he's looking inside, and his armor is filled with holes. So anyone uh, who can see what's going on can just attack those holes and, and tear him to pieces. Basically, trying to copy the solver is not only impossible, it's also potentially very counterproductive. But that begs the question, why do so many high six players still use the RNG? Well, one reason is that it's just very difficult to play a solid preflop game without randomizing. Imagine if we open and face an in-position 3-bet. Here, almost every combo is mixing between 4-bet and call or call and fold. If we were to play pure exploit, 
that is pick the option we think is best 100% of the time, we would end up with frequencies that are way off GTO. This is especially problematic when it comes to preflop because our opponents don't need a very big sample to figure out our strategy. Whatever exploit we make quickly becomes visible on our opponent's HUD, leaving us vulnerable to getting counter-exploited. So for preflop specifically, a lot of players opt to use an RNG in order to not get too far out of line. However, if you're playing low stakes or any kind of soft life game, then all of this goes out of the window. In these games, players generally have a fixed strategy that they follow and they don't pay that much attention to what you're doing. They also tend to have a poor understanding of theory and might not even realize it when they're getting exploited. For example, one of the most profitable exploits in these games is to 3-bet a very wide and linear range in position. This doesn't work in the tough online game because out of position would simply adjust by 4-betting wider, which puts all of our linear 3-bets in a tough spot. But in the soft life game, players often react differently to aggression. They are uncomfortable with 4-betting light, but at the same time, they also don't want to get run over. So they adjust in the only way they can, which is to call wider. Unfortunately for them, this plays right into our strategy. Remember, even though our 3 bet range is wide, it's also strong and linear, consisting of hands that have excellent equity and playability. Basically, it's a range that is designed to play post-flop. So now we have a vicious cycle where we 3 bet really wide, our opponent gets frustrated and calls more, which allows us to 3 bet even wider and so on. A really profitable situation for us, and one where it's completely unnecessary to be randomizing. Another situation where randomizing is unnecessary is on the river. As we go further down the game tree, it becomes more and more difficult for our opponents to understand what our strategy really is. This allows us to be much more imbalanced without having to worry about getting counter-exploited. If you're like me and you follow Saulo Costa on YouTube, you'll know that he's one of the many players who utilize the RNG. But if you really pay attention, you'll realize that he only uses it very occasionally, mostly on earlier streets. And the closer he gets to the river, the more he relies on a mix of data and intuition. On the left, I defended my big blind here with Jack Tenoff against Hijack Minrays. Pretty standard stuff. He goes for a small size on this board. I'm going to call here. I think he could have other best size on the stack here if he wanted to. He very quickly checks back on a very blank three of clubs turn. So his check back range is quite weak here. I'm going to have a lot of equity on the showdown against pocket pairs. And then when he reopens, I don't think I can call this. I don't see many bluffs in his range. And also, he might still have way too many ace of club X hands to bluff catch against Ray. So I'm not going to turn this into a bluff. And I'm just going to fold this one. This hand is really interesting because from a theoretical perspective, check 10 with a club is quite a decent bluff catcher. On top of that, we're facing a relatively small bet of half pot. If Saulo wanted to be balanced, he should probably randomize some frequency of calls with this combo. Instead, he quickly chooses to fold, reasoning that hijack is likely under bluffing. And we can see why if we look at how this pot works in theory. Because of how tight hijack's range is and how well it interacts with the board, no pair only makes up 2.9% of their range. So in order to find enough bluffs, Hijack needs to draw bluffs from pairs like 7s and 8s. If Saulo thinks that an actual opponent will not bet these hands, then it goes without saying that they would be massively under bluffing. And in that case, it makes a lot of sense to be folding a marginal bluff catcher like Jack 10. Of course, with every exploit comes a risk of getting counter exploited. If players knew that Saulo was overfolding this spot, they could counter adjust by turning 100% of their pocket pairs into bluffs. But as mentioned before, this isn't a real concern in practice. It takes a huge sample to piece together someone's strategy on the river, and even then, you can never be 100% sure that you have the right picture. For example, after seeing Saulo make a very tight fold in the previous hand, 
you might think that it's a good idea to bluff them more in the bet check bet line. But here, the details matter as well. If you were to do this from late position, chances are that you would get called down extremely light. This is because late position ranges are much wider and contain way more trash that players might be tempted to bluff with. It's the classic overbluffed spot, and Salvo isn't afraid to capitalize on it by calling all of his bluff catchers. The point is that without a nuanced understanding of theory or data, it's very difficult to make sense of Salvo's strategy. He's playing like a nit in some spots, and the calling station in others. Technically, you could exploit him by turning all your pairs into a bluff from early position, and giving up 100% of your air from late position. But how many players in the pool are actually capable of doing that? It's completely unintuitive, and not something you need to worry about unless you're playing the highest stakes. Which you're probably not if you're watching this video, so ditch the RNG and thank me later. Saulo might be pretty hardcore when it comes to exploits, but this player actually makes him look balanced. Or you can also watch this video which YouTube thinks you'll like.